this. And today we have Mr. Anirudh Gumanan, uh, Director of Atha India Ventures. Welcome, Anirudh. How are you doing today? It's very good. Thank you so much, Abhishek, and thank you for inviting me for this podcast. Uh, really looking forward to uh, speaking to you about our journey and and uh, you know and and having a chance to interact with the audience. Glad to have you today as a part of the Treasury Elite Entrepreneurship Series. Next 30, 35 minutes, we'd love to know about your experiences, the latest trends in the private market investing space, right? So, Anil, uh, take us through the journey of how did you build up Arta Energy and then build the Arta Venture Fund. How did you convince yourself to do, do this? And what were the hurdles? And how was the family's reaction? Just take us through that. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I should probably start off by saying that I'm, I i didn't have your traditional path to becoming a VC. I've had a very interesting role uh, over the last, I would say, almost uh, 17, 18 years since I've graduated. I come from a fourth generation family of entrepreneurs. Uh, this is our third, uh, second generation managing or, or you know, uh, investing capital. But uh, so my great grandfather started out by, uh, you know, he used to be a bullion merchant in a town called Bikaner. Uh, in the early 1900s. And then uh, my grandfather took it from Bikaner to Calcutta, which at that time was foreign, right? If you, if you go back to the early, uh, you know, mid to early 1900s. And then my father brought it from Calcutta to Bombay. And we started investing in stocks in the late, late 70s. So by the late uh, 90s, you know, this was obviously boom time. Stocks were doing very, very well. My, my dad started diversifying further into real estate development. And I, as all Marwadis do, you know, they started investing in private equity and, and um, also got into hospitality for that matter. I uh, have, a, have had a very different upbringing. However, I, um, after graduation, I actually started out as a door-to-door -door salesman. I sold long-term power contracts in West Texas uh, and first initially to homeowners and then to uh, p business owners. Uh, did that for a period of almost um, Seven years, actually, I, I started out by uh, as, as a door-to-door -door sales agent and built myself into becoming a director of sales and then eventually uh, becoming an entrepreneur in the space. I ran the company for three and a half, four years, sold that, came back to India in 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of ups and downs, lots of learnings, and we'll get into that, uh, I'm sure, as we, as we speak uh, further. I actually came back to India because I thought India's commercial energy market was going to be very ripe for the taking. Uh, unfortunately, when I landed here, uh, the uh, the previous government's uh, you know maximum number of issues were with infrastructure and and uh, power sector uh, investments. So I had a very tough time getting started and getting off the ground in India. So I really started investing into startups more of like a creative release uh, because starting a business in India was so much different than running and operating and starting a business in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, uh, after about 15, 20 companies, I, it really became, I mean, it became a full-time passion, actually. So uh, today we're invested in over 105 startups uh, directly. We've, uh, you know, we're LPs in multiple different funds. Uh, we have our own uh, India's first micro VC fund for early stage investing, uh, which is uh, one of India's top performing funds now. Uh, and it, it's been a great journey. I, I think, like I said, it's a very odd way of a door-to-door -door salesman becoming uh, uh, the managing partner at a VC fund, but it's just, uh, it's just the way the, the, the I, I think it was the best way to become a VC was, was to start off as an entrepreneur and then land up as, uh, you know, a person who invests in other, other startups. Excellent, excellent. In fact, your initial journey of family is very similar to our journey. Um, from Rajasthan to Calcutta, Calcutta, Rangoon, I mean, from Rangoon, Rangoon to Calcutta, Calcutta, imports, then real estate, and then I moved to Bombay. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, so uh, so one of the investments was Oyo Ipa Nord, right. which was very much talked about and was interesting. So take us through some of your very interesting investments. What did you see? And also the not too good investments where the entire money got ruined. Uh, and some of your... Uh, uh, some of the maths, you know, when somebody's investing in a VC fund or doing angel investing, what kind of a maths that one should look at an ROI, exit fees? Just a broad. Great, great question. I'll, I'll try to tackle it one at a time. I, but let me start with the last question first, right? So, uh, as a as a VC fund manager, right, you usually have quarterly reports you give to customer, you give to your uh, rather your investors. 
uh, and where you explain your IRR and where you're tracking. Uh, unfortunately, when you have a father like mine, uh, who's also in the stock markets, your quarterly board meeting is actually <laughs> every night, right? Because you, <laughs> you're pretty much explaining where things are headed every yeah. single day. Uh, so, and the thing is that there are, we have a very high high opportunity cost. I mean, as, as, as you would, right? Because there's so many options to invest invest your capital. And when the listed space is has been done doing as well as it has over the last 30 years in India, you definitely have to beat it with a very handsome amount of margin to be able to attract capital away from that kind of a cost. So right. effectively, you know, the way we've always tracked this is that, you know, I, I'd like to beat the Nifty uh, 500 by at least a factor of 3x over, over the same period, right? When I'm calculating return, that's my minimum return that I'm looking at. So over the last uh, 10 years, you know, we've invested in 105 startups. Uh, we're roughly sitting at almost about a 60, 62% IRR. Uh, we've exited uh, enough capital to pay off, pay off three times what we've initially invested. And uh, we've had 13 write-offs, 23 or 23 or 24 exists. I think that I'm not sure the 24th one is just about getting signed or is already done. Uh, so it's been a very interesting journey, right? And over the years, I know, I know OYO is a very exciting thing that happened, uh, but over the years, we've been able to really pick out specific themes to invest into. We've not been sectoral investors, very thematic. And that's really worked well because, you know, startups usually need about five to seven to 10 years to be able to show you true returns, right? You know, a startup is not the same as investing in stocks when you are, you know, and, and where people are holding it for two, three years. It truly requires the vision of 10 years. And therefore, thematic investing has done really well for us because, you know, themes take a bit of time to play out. So our themes primarily have been 30% allocation to consumer ecosystem for 30% allocation to, so, uh, to com companies that are helping the direct to consumer ecosystem flourish and 40% allocation to B2B SaaS. Yes. Uh, and and that, that's been our allocation across the company. So we have a very sizable SaaS portfolio. Uh, in fact, there should be one or two unicorns coming out of that very shortly. Uh, we've got a sizable, uh, you know, direct to consumer portfolio. We've got OYO, obviously very recognized, uh, startup. We also have purple. I'm a mm -hmm. first stage, uh, first round investor in purple, which just turned unicorn about a month and a half, two months ago. Uh, we've done some very interesting stuff in deep tech SaaS companies. Uh, there's one unicorn, two unicorns out of the U S where I'm an early stage investor. Uh, one is in the micro lending space. And then one is, um, a company that is actually 3d printing homes. So they can literally print a 4,000 square foot home in 24 hours and get it ready for, for delivery. And uh, with, with four trucks, they could print our entire neighborhood. Very, very interesting company. Uh, but obviously the, the fun part has been not just making all, all, all this capital or all this wealth. It really has been that to be involved in these companies when they were when no one was looking at that. Right? Like Oyo was just a one-person company when we started. Right. Uh, Purple was just a two, two to three-person company when we started. We've seen these companies flourish we've seen them struggle and and the fun part is today uh when you watch these companies and the impact that these companies have had on the ecosystem the impact that these companies have had uh not just in india even globally in many cases and what what we see them becoming in the next 10 years that's what gets really really exciting for us uh yeah. effectively uh you know some of the stories i think oyo was the first time uh any angel in india had actually seen money uh, back at that factor, right? We invested at a $500,000 valuation, roughly two and a half, three crores at the time. And when we exited, it was close to, it was close to about a 6,000 crore valuation, just over a billion dollar valuation at the time. And until then, Abhishek, if you remember in 2016, there was a very popular saying in private equity, it's a gambling, gambling, it's a gambling business. <laughs> But that was the first time that, you know, that there was a 300 X kind of an exit into, in a company in under four years and money actually came out. And I think it really got the ecosystem to sit up uh, all, all the big family offices and investors who are investing in real estate. They suddenly saw an avenue that here, Hey, you know what, there is probably a way to make money over here. And we have zero allocation to startups. Uh, so 2016 to 19 was when a lot of family offices, a lot of UHNIs, started reaching out, we started co-investing together uh, and we built, a, built some really strong relationships in the ecosystem. Uh, that portfolio, by the way, has done fantastic. Between 16 and 19, the portfolio is sitting at almost 90% IRR uh, and, and it's seen 13 exits out of 29 companies and we returned five times capital on that. Uh, so like I said, it's been a very exciting journey. It's, 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 been, a, it's been a 
very rewarding journey, both in terms of money, but also in terms of learning. And the fact that what, what really makes me excited to get out of bed every morning is the fact that, you know, there is an ability to impact the lives of thousands, if not tens of thousands, just through backing uh, entrepreneurs at the early stages, right? These companies, when they become big, uh, they start employing, you know, thousands of people uh, directly and indirectly. And that really gets you excited, right? And I think as long as we're chasing that and doing the duty as an investor, where, uh, you know, I'm going to keep waking out, jumping out of bed, ready to go to work. Mm -hmm. So Anil, uh, now, very interesting point that you put across was that the benchmark is BSC 500. And, uh, and NSC 500. NSC 500. And uh, that becomes your benchmark. So I think that it would have given what, 15, 16%? Uh, so 16 to 18% if you look at the 2011 to 2021 period. So yeah. So then, look, then one should be looking at 22, 23%. If no, no. You are in Factor of 3x, sir. I would say minimum of 50% IRR. If you're not doing 50% IRR in, 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 in this space, the risk doesn't make sense, right? To be honest, the risk, there, there is obviously a lot of risk. You're always working against the law of averages. Roughly uh, out of 10 companies that you invest in, you're going to have at least four to, four to five getting written off. You'll have yeah. one or two that'll give the capital back. One probably will give you a decent, you know, five to eight X kind of return. And then there'll be one or two. Uh, if you get two, obviously the, it's a great portfolio, but if you get even one, that is going to return 10 to 12 times, maybe 20 times the money. This, this is the usual distribution curve that people talk about. Uh, that, you know, because the money gets laid out over four years and then you're, you know, harvesting that over, the, over, over another six year period, roughly can get you about a 40 to 50% IRR quite easily, as long as you're doing the basics right. And I think we'll get into that. Uh, if, I mean, I can take that up right now, but the most important thing when you're entering a company is due diligence. Right. I, I think more than more than importance about whether it's the right idea, whether it's the right market, those are th those are critical factors, right? But what's more important is how much due diligence have you done on your own that is not being given to you by the founder, right? So 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 things like reaching out to customers, reaching out to suppliers, reaching out to competitors, reaching out to current incumbents in a, in a in, in an ecosystem, and really getting a true idea about why these companies that are setting up, you know, these products or services are so important. You know, you know, we worked on four very simple principles, four principles of investing. Number one, are, are they solving a real human problem, right? Many startups, and you'll see this, uh, it's funny to say this, but many times they build great technology and then they try to figure out what's the problem we're solving, right? Versus, you know, you need to know what the problem you're solving and then build technology for it. So of course. very, very important that, you know, you know exactly what problem are you solving? Is it a real, real human problem? And is there a target, you know, who's the target segment you're going to go after, right? Because that bleeds into my second sec, second uh, philosophy or core principle is that, is that positive unit economics, right? See that, I mean, uh, many people on this podcast, obviously are managing money. Many of them are CFAs, CAs. Uh, there is no math in the world. There is no economics available. There is no accounting principle, which can take a gross loss and turn that into a net profit. Right. It just does not happen. Right. If you're having a gross loss, you're going to have a net loss. So agar positive unit, unit economics, nahi hai, if you are not going to make money on every single transaction at some point in your life journey, right, you're never going to make a net profit. And yeah. the dharma of a business is to have a net profit in the long run. Right. right. Maybe two years down the line, three years down the line, but you have to churn a profit to be net net positive to society. So that's point number two. Point number three for us is what's your moat? Why moat. are people coming back to you again and again? Right? What's the hook? It's very simple. I'm not even asking. Like Swiggy has a very significant hook. The fact that you can get food in 30 minutes, right? And they're, 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 they're making it very, very easy to choose from a wide variety of places. Amazon, unfortunately, people believe that it provides the lowest prices. Amazon never, never advertises prices. It says that we give you from A to Z anything you want. They are there for convenience. They, they're there for the breadth of products available. So what's the hook? What keeps people coming back, right? And so that's your moat usually. And then fourth thing that is really important is that look at technology as an enabler, right? Technology cannot be the business. Right. Very few businesses in the world can survive without a business model. Right? I think none it would be the right, right answer. But what happens is that, that people get so enamored by technology that think that they think that if, if they build great technology, the business is going to flow, right? But look at the businesses that have done well, right? They're very, very simple businesses. Oyo is not some high-tech, high-funder business, right? It's a very simple business 
which got accelerated using technology. Same thing for Purple, same thing for many of these companies that, that, that have done well for us. So as long as they meet those four simple criteria, the four simple principles we have, we're usually investing in that company. So Anirudh, now let's let's assume that if you have to advise a family office which has say two hundred million dollars yeah. of investable money, and he is agnostic about the sector or the asset class, and uh, he wants to try out private equity angel investing in VC as an asset class, what should be his application? How should be how should the promoter look at it? What kind of expected returns? What kind of fee? And what kind of, uh, what, I mean, the money is not going to be, uh, you know, entry exit any one of time. So the money has to be held on. How should he look at those investments? What size? I mean, assuming that he is a fairly, I mean, moderate risk taker, what should be his size out of that 200 million that he should be looking at? Just, just your thoughts on this. Oh, great, great idea. I think if you're saying that 200 million is total investable corpus, right? I would probably, uh, again, and this is internally, we keep doing this kind of math, right? And uh, with confidence, the numbers are obviously going up. But I would probably start off by allocating maybe 15%, right? And, and this is obviously for a little bit of a moderately aggressive portfolio. Uh, so roughly out of 200 million, 30 million, I would allocate for this entire sector, private equity, VC, and angel. Uh, I'll start by saying that private equity usually, um, again, it's, a, it, it's private equity funds are exciting because they give you access to, uh, you know, very late stage pre IPO style companies, but you have to realize that those, those IRRs are not as high as VC, right? So usually, uh, it is perceived to be lower risk. Uh, however, at least in, at least the way I have read it, you know, you're taking the same kind of risk that you would take with unlisted equity because many times these, you know, you're writing very large checks into these companies. And they may not turn out to be exactly how we wanted to, but roughly if I was doing private equity, I wouldn't look at anything below one and a half times, you know, that same nifty, let's, let's take nifty 500 as the basis, right? If it's 18%, uh, then I, I need to, I need to generate at least 30% out of private equity minimum, right? And then a net of fees, net of everything that I'm paying out, right? So that's what, that's the way I would look at it. Um, 30% banta hai, India mein, private equity mein. 30%, yeah, there are, there are, there are certain funds that have done that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, again, I, we, I have uh, no exposure to private equity, private equity myself, but there are certain really good funds that have, that have been able to generate that kind of returns, you know? So even if you look at in the listed space, there are certain PMSs that have beat that kind of return also, right? Yeah. So, so I think it, it really is a factor of looking at past performance and understanding that's the strategy that, you go, that they're going after, right? So, uh, again, again, and, if, and here's my second point. If they're not doing that, then why just not invest in the Nifty 500, right? My second question, Pusan, if they're 30% beat, then what's Nifty 500? Ah, exactly, that's my point. Yeah. Nifty 500 ETF annualized fees annualized fees less than 0.4%, right? And there's no carry. So simple, no? I mean, if I'm going to pay carry to somebody, they have to give me returns that are more than what Nifty, Nifty 500 ETF is going to give me. So, so I think that's the way... I, I chase that kind of a return. I think uh, second, if I'm looking at VC, I would, I would, uh, so maybe out of 30 million allocate 10 million over there, right? I'd allocate another 10 million in VC in probably three segments. I would look at something early stage. I would look at something mid stage and probably something late stage. Late stage is right before private equity also. So it's, it's, it's a bit fungible. Uh, early stage may you need to be chasing three X. Of Nifty 500, right? And whatever the time period you're taking, it has it has to be looked at in that way. Mid stage probably two two and a half, two to two and a half times. And again, I, I, the math I leave to you. I'm just saying this is how I look at it, right? And when looking at late stage VC, at least two x, right? So ye aapka ek allocation ho jayega of the way you look at it. So two x in five years. This is I would say over a period of seven to ten years. Five years is very short. I think five years ke kya hoga ki, And again, uh, you look, go with the outlook of ten years. When you invest, usually you get the exits in five to seven years. Most of our exits have been at five years, but we always invested with 10 years in mind, right? So patience is very, very important simply because you're trying to build a good business, right? Uh, and kya hota hai ki if you're building a great business, the exit, I believe comes in faster. It's growing sustainably. Guess what? All investors and everybody wants, wants to buy that and you get great prices. But if you're dressing up something just for the purpose of fundraising, Right, the investors are smart enough to see the skeleton. Right, that it's not just about the outside, but it's not just about the muscle. You know, 
तो तो दैट इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट यू हैव टू गो विद द आउटलुक की आर आई एम इन इट फॉर 10 इयर्स आई एम इन इट इवन फॉर 20 इयर्स इफ इट्स अ ग्रेट बिजनेस आई मीन वॉरन बफेट फेमिली फेमिली सेड राइट लाइक माय होल्डिंग पीरियड इज फॉरएवर राइट सो सो लुक एट इट फ्रॉम दैट पर्सपेक्टिव एंड देन व्हेन यू गेट अ ग्रेट प्राइस टू एग्जिट फॉर योर पेशेंस यू एग्जिट यू नो बट डोंट गो इनटू द बिजनेस विद द इंटेंट कि मेरे को 5 साल में 3 साल में पैसे निकालना क्योंकि अगर आप उस इंटेंट से जाओगे देन यू आर ऑलवेज प्लेइंग देन यू आर गैम्बलिंग even in the listed space abhishek is it possible to really say ki aap 3 saal ke andar great return bana sakte ho matlab you have to have some yeah, yeah. 5 years to minimum hai right but the greatest returns that i have made are always companies that have held more than 10 years i still hold infosys from 2006 i have not sold it right i still own microsoft from 2008 matlab aap jab unko wo 10 12 saal sekhte ho then you see the multi bagger returns now i sold a lot of that in 2021 22 bull run because they were finally beyond the parameters which made me comfortable but hum 13 years se ka in cheezon ko you know so I, i think it's very very important that uh, when you're looking at uh, these kind of returns you go with a 10 year outlook go with a fund manager that is looking at a 10 year outlook right and you'll definitely get returns faster than that you know and and then i, I would probably allocate 10 another you know i would probably so between the, both of these about 75 80% of the money goes there now i'll keep 20% but not for angel Let me be very, very honest. I think angel investment, not just in India, globally, is is dying and is dying a very fast time, right? Because what happened is that most of the see, India has matured into a very uh, advanced uh, startup economy very, very quickly. Today, there are eighty to ninety micro VC funds in India. Just eighty to ninety of that. If you look at uh, Sequoia, you look at the larger larger uh, funds. They have raised billions of dollars to deploy into the Indian startup ecosystem. So. all of them you know all, this is becoming a very institutionalized market very very quickly so kya ho raha hai ki usually angel networks are getting the adverse selected companies right that no other fund is going to do and mm-hmm. even if they're getting an opportunity to get invested into a company another thing that's happening is they're not getting the right rights see it's not mm-hmm. just about investing direct in a company aap ye samajhiye it is not like the listed market ki aapne ja ke 100 share you know Timex ki or so share ki si ek company khareed liye and you are at the same level as everybody else in the market. Esa nahi hai, right? The guy holding the preference equity shares, which are better rights with better information rights, is infinitely better than you. And unfortunately, the companies cannot afford to, and the funds won't allow them to give all the best rights to the low, the lowest shareholder. Right? There are thresholds. So as an angel network, usually apko wo rights milte hi nahi, right? And then you pay them fees. You have to pay. You know, you you have to give them power of attorney so they can sign off on documents for you. आपके पास कुछ power नहीं है, right? Better of being. I mean, you're literally doing what you would do with a fund manager, but you're you're taking direct equity risk in these cases, right? Right. So at least in 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 what I have preferred recently is to be more of a syndicate, invest through syndicates, where there is one person and and you know I have a family of a syndicate that I also run. Where where we act as a lead, we do all the due diligence for for all the families that are connected to us. and they can directly invest into a deal but we have a sizable equity chunk like we are doing 15 to 20 crore checks into a single deal at one time so we get sizable sizable uh, ownership of the company and we also get lots of lead equity lead equity rights aur iski bahut badi value hai people that have done exits and thankfully i have done 24 of them till date uh, aapko tab realize hoga at time of exit ki in rights ki value kya thi Because okay. depending on the rights and the kind of share you hold, you may have to you may have to give zero percent discount to giving as much as sixty percent discount to exit a company. So, if you think if you have a company with three hundred X made, and you get a chance to maybe give a five percent discount and exit, so three hundred X becomes two eighty five X. And imagine if you have a quality of share, there is a common equity share, and you have to give a fifty percent exit. This means that the last round of the whole upside has gone. Right. so you just have to be smart about the fact that you know without writing sizable checks angel investment is direct investment sounds exciting it definitely is a lot more work than you imagine right so get the right people uh, that can get you the right deal flow and very very much focus on the rights then i would allocate 20% of the capital to go along with my fund managers and say ki whenever there's an opportunity to co-invest can you share that with me right and i'll be able to probably write you know four to five checks a year so over a period of five or six years i probably deployed You know, up to thirty million, ka six million, what? So roughly, I would have deployed a million dollars a year just in direct, right? But that's only possible if you have good relationship with fund managers. You're invested in their fund, and then they offer you co-investment rights into, uh, you know, in, into the companies they're invested in, into. But direct so angels. Now, 
we got the demarcation. Now, what should be the overall cost that the family office should bear on this 15% of the portfolio, all in? And you're not including the internal staff that you have to hire, right? So that's okay. That's 1%. Let's assume he's, a, he's having a half a million dollar, early not even half a million dollars. Uh, see, early stage, may usually about... So again, I'll use our example, our early stage fund, the uh, management fee is 1.5% per year, right? And that's on the committed capital, not on the, not on the appraised capital. Uh, so that I, I think that for an early stage fund is, is roughly what is becoming the global average. Uh, so one and a half percent, because, you know, then you obviously the, the fund, they will start pushing on, you know, with some of the fund, some of the expenses of the funds go up because yeah. you know, then you can't attract the right talent also. Uh, and, uh, the, the way the sec, the, what's really important more than, you know, I've done this math on my blog as well, by the way, what's more important than the management fee? See one and a half, one percent, one and a half percent, it's not going to be a big deal. Over a period of seven, see, we have to draw down this over seven years, right? So, what's really important is that what is, what are the fund expenses, right? That are going to get charged to you. So usually the audit the SEBI trusteeship fees and the annual appraisal uh, is usually charged directly to the investor. But if they're charging other expenses, so suddenly you can look like yeah, 1% of the fund expense is 1%. Uh, correct, correct. So, you know, we have a cap of 0.5% annually. We've so far tracked about 0.3% until now. Uh, I think those are very, very important. Secondly, what is the hurdle rate? Right? At what, so after returning the capital back to you that you've invested, how much is the minimum return you make before there is a profit sharing? Right. So in, in that, and that gets very, very interesting because in our case, it is 10%, right. And then we take up anything above 10%. So minimum 10% return, karne ke baad, whatever is above that, then we take a 75, 25 share, 75% to you, 25% to us. So I think those kind of things really, really matter in, in the, in the longer run. I think half a percent here or there is not going to make anybody, uh, you know, usually, uh, you know, my early stage VC funds are what, like 500 to a thousand crore funds, right? So half percent, you know, is not going to make a huge difference. Uh, yes. When you get to private equity stuff, usually the management fees are higher. Probably I've seen them about at about 2%. I've seen some 3% deals also as an LP. Um, but that's the nature of the game here. I, I think, the, you know, each private equity deal takes six to 12 months to close, right? And uh, you're deploying hundreds of millions of dollars of cash. In, in most cases, 25, 30 million to check out the minimum. Uh, so those kind of things require some expensive teams. Uh, and, but like I said, as long as it's a good performing fund and they have, see, just make sure that their incentives are aligned with your incentives, right? Just make sure that it's not, it's a fund that, that only makes money if they've returned money and a minimum hurdle, right? You know, they, they, these are portfolio return funds. You make sure there's not deal by deal, deal by deal carry. SAP fund is where profit is carried, where the loss is carried, but effectively you're not paying 20%, you're probably paying 30% carry. Right. Uh, you know, look, look for funds which have a portfolio level carry. I have done plus minus, I have done carry. But SAP funds are there, that will have a deal by deal carry. Hmm. Right? So those are the kind of things that are very important. But early stage, 1.5% is good. Something that's very exciting recently, and then obviously private equity about 2 to 2.5%. Two depending on the size, but something very exciting has happened recently. There's a few of us who started this thing called what's called the winner's fund or a follow on fund. And where we create side cards, uh, where we invest in the winners of our own portfolio, right? So company bought a perform career, whose future around we invest. Those are very low cost funds. I mean, we worked out the math and it's like 0.75% management fee. And that's the, almost at the level of an ETF, right? Cause ETF is 0.4% on the NAV, right? The NAV keeps going up. In our case, it's only 0.75% of the committed capital. Yeah. So even if the NAV goes up, wo aapka yeah. fee same level. So it's almost at the level of uh, level of an idea, but it's a very exciting way of entering the startup because the risk is much lower. You're entering companies with where the uh, where uh, the fund manager already has a previous relationship, has probably a sizable equity in, in the company, and you're entering the company when they're doing a sizable large round with a sizable VC putting in most of the capital leading, leading the round. You're just capitalizing on the early early position. Both exciting. How do, you get access? How do you get access to this? So, you know, I mean, uh, we have, a, we've, uh, we, we've just started that fund. In fact, you know, we're just currently doing internal, uh, uh, like basically doing a closed door round in stealth mode with our current LPs. Uh, 
there are a few of them that have done it. I think 314 has a, 314 has a winner's fund. Uh, we have, I mean, Artha has a winner's fund and there is a couple more uh, that I believe have, have a winner's fund. Great opportunities to get in, especially in a low cost, uh, low cost, low risk, lower risk, rather not low risk, but lower risk and a high growth environment. Uh, yeah, idea, Mujib, Abhishek, is that I've invested in a company uh, without taking the name right now, but uh, we invested in 2012. The company did not raise a follow on round for seven years, right? And they went from a zero ARR business to 100 crore ARR business in seven years. Then the next round raised here at roughly around 200 crore valuation. And they raised roughly about 20, 30 crores. We had a chance probably to put in money, but there was no fund that could put money in that valuation. Right? So Series B valuation to use company. Uh, the investor that came in, now that company's valuation is tracking, uh, they're now at a 600 crore ARR company. The company valuation is 3,500 crore. I'm very happy. I'm sitting on almost 300x multiple on the company. And the IRR is currently close to about 75, 80%. But you know what really hurts me? So he came later than me in a company that had a better ARR than where I invested, yeah, you know, a hundred crore ARR company and he's tracking better IRR than me. Right. And that's what really hurt me. He had an opportunity and I have a relationship in these companies because we are the earliest investors in, in, in these companies. So, well, so these kind of funds capitalize on that early position, you know, and are able to really uh, maximize. It's not very high multiple, but very high IRR funds. So winners funds or select funds are a very good way to get into the ecosystem. Very interesting. And the good part is Anil, that last time I was talking to Pranav, he was saying that 92-93% of the money is still coming from abroad. But lately I've seen a lot of VC funds getting 100% of the money from India. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we, uh, we talk about ourselves, our fund one, we had targeted to raise 100 crore, and then we raised the target to 200 crore. We ended up raising 225 crore. Say, I would say 80, 85% capital local. You know, that and was, what and was the average ticket size? Average, so we had roughly about 70 investors for 225, so roughly two and a half to three crores per investor, effectively. Uh -huh. And uh, these are what, the gentry of EOs and YPOs of the country? So it was very interestingly, we had 20 or 25 odd listed companies that invested either directly or through their uh, promoter families. We had uh, roughly about, I would say about 20, 25 angel investors or UHNIs that came in direct. And uh, then we had, uh, uh, Sidvi was the largest investor and then we were the second largest. So that was the makeup. There was, if I talk about abroad, uh, there was some, uh, you know, European families that came in direct and there was some families out of, uh, the Gulf and a few families from the U S that came in. So overall, uh, the mix was 80, 20. And, uh, it was, I mean, we were really surprised with the response. I, I think it really helped that we had, uh, you know, that we had a family of his background. And so many of these, uh, many of these investors were very, uh, they got a lot of confidence because, you know, you had somebody backing the fund and they weren't just putting the smallest amount possible. They were putting in four times the second limit and saying, we're going to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, and that's what, that's what got them, uh, you know, really uh, excited to put large chunks of capital. In fact, one of our best LPs to be interesting, uh, Abhishek was, uh, took a 30 minute call and, and he was, uh, he wrote the largest check, single check that we had, 30 minute. He's like, done. Uh -huh. And he wired the money within a week. It was amazing. And to, to me, that that what what it what really does was that it was a responsibility that they had so much faith in us. So now we have to make sure this has to be one of the best returns that they'll ever make in the PVC space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That always is there. <laughs> I think uh, recent valuations have corrected uh, more in the private equity space globally. I think just before this fall. But the VC money has been still coming in. Yeah. What's the outlook in this space? How should investors look at it? And what's the right time? Nobody can time it, but has the right time passed or right now is the right time? So I'll start by saying this is my fourth recession in 10 years. So it seems like <laughs> <laughs> the younger investors go through recessions much quicker than maybe my father did. Uh, but uh, the best time to invest in PVC is not in the middle of a boom cycle. 
right? It's, it's right now when the, there's nobody else investing or there's a lot of tepidness between invest with, with, with investors about deploying new capital, right? So agar aapke paas, if you have liquidity at this time, you get some of the best deals. And I can, I mean, in a one-on-one conversation, I can actually show you the, show you the years when there we made investments in, 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 you know, the tough years or the, or the recession years. And the IRR is just, is just an alpha to our entire portfolio. 2016, uh, 15 the minute, ek bhi, ek bhi naya paisa laga. I did not invest in anything in 15. If you look at my history of investing, lagi, kuch kiya nahi hai. literally kuch nahi kiya tha because we could not understand the valuations for, for a year. Ki ho kya hai ecosystem ko. And then 16 May, once that correction happened, we invested in 18 companies within 12 months. Hmm. Right. And that portfolio has done so well. It's an it's a literally outlier to the entire returns of the portfolio because Right. We got the best deals. We got the best rights. We were able to, you know, negotiate uh, really good positions for ourselves. And overall, you know, founders obviously were not able to get capital from any, anywhere else at the moment. So we, they, they also got what they needed. Right. And we were able to work very closely in making this portfolio flourish. So if you're going with a 10 year outlook, right. Again, like you said, you can never time the market effectively, but I think that India's story is The India story has just started. This is India's decade and literally we have to do something absolutely grossly wrong to screw it up. Right. So if you look at the India consumer ecosystem, we are currently the largest consumer ecosystem growing at the pace we're growing at in the world. Right. We have a single consumer market. GST has literally changed our life in India. Right. Today, a person making Kela wafers in uh, the homemade, uh, uh, the, those uh, banana chips in Kerala can ship them from there to Calcutta and it'll get there within 48 hours and without it getting stuck anywhere along the way, right? 48 can get there in 24 hours also if required. India's consumer market has rapidly changed. See, we are going through what I call as the next leap. India went through many leaps in its history, right? We went, we, went, we did not go to landline, we went straight to mobile. We did not go to dialogue, we went straight to fiber. We did not go, you know, into, into cable TV when straight to OTT, right? The coverage of OTT in India is far bigger. India consumes more data on mobile than US and China combined that on a per user basis. That is a telling statistic. Hmm. Online e-commerce has reached, D2C has reached, right? And that is revolutionizing the way Indians are going to consume. And that's that. That that is a behemoth you cannot stop. In fact, what COVID has done, Abhishek, is that it has just accelerated the adoption of digital. When my father and my mother are comfortable buying on Swiggy, they're comfortable transacting on Amazon. India has changed, right? right? And that's what I'm seeing today. I think the next leap, and which we're investing very heavily into right now, is going to be lending. Sorry. India has lending. Lending. Yeah. I think India's household debt to GDP is roughly about. 11 to 13 percent roughly yeah. and if you compare that to china which is at close to 55 60 percent and us is probably close to 80 90 percent we have a long way to go right and and the reason why lending is also not penetrated very deep into the consumer ecosystem or household ecosystem is because we have not been able to build the infrastructure to be able to lend to people right the bnpl the bahut chota, these, these numbers are very very small indians are still used to saving and spending today what they weren't yesterday right or the or the month before when indians become comfortable with spending what i will earn tomorrow and spend that today the consumer ecosystem will explode if you look at the us of the 60s right why did why was it a boom year because lending was happening at a fast pace i think what the current government or the current dispensation has done through the use of aadhaar has made it very easy for you to track uh, you know track consumers and track their behavior in terms of utilizing credit and it is going to reap us huge benefits in the future. Because once you can really understand how a consumer, a person uh, can consume credit, it changes the way they consume, right? And I, th- I think th- that, that is one, one thing that is that we're really, really excited about uh, in, the, in the coming uh, say, you know, five to seven years. Right, right. So very interesting. Very interesting. So I think one, one good conclusion, obviously, since private markets come with more risk, and right now the risk aversion environment is not there, most of the, I would say the exercise is gone. I think, uh, at least, 
अगर इक्विटी मार्केट्स में थर्टीन फोर्टीन फिफ्टीन परसेंट क्या अगर आएगा कम से कम प्राइवेट मार्केट्स में भी वी शुड बी लुकिंग एट एटलीस्ट ट्वेंटी फाइव थर्टी परसेंट अगर एट दिस पॉइंट या great great time to invest again uh, you know usually you you uh, just for everyone's knowledge as well usually you commit money to a private equity fund or a vc fund um, and usually they draw down that capital over 3 to 4 years right so it's not like you put all the money today yeah. like you would in the mutual fund right uh, and and so the, the, when you when they're investing they're also time you know they're also taking time in deploying the money so while you commit today you'll get some opportunities now and then they slowly deploy that money over a period of time uh so if you if you have liquidity you should definitely be looking at private markets and and again choose your choose the vc fund manager um, or the private equity fund manager carefully uh, again it's a great time to also for them for you to actually choose who you get right when there's a boom time and everybody's throwing money at them maybe we are too busy <laughs> discussing uh, with too many people this is a great time to get and understand really what what the what the returns are and what how are they tracking what are they thinking and uh, be able to deploy money very judici- very judiciously so any uh, when you talk about a fund deal flow is very important yeah how does a guy know that this so of course everybody somebody 1000 crore somebody recently we raised 700 million one of these funds size is getting bigger and bigger the bigger the size the more difficult to generate the irr very true you know at the same time deal flow sabko nahi aata how does one decide kis vc fund mein paisa dalega see i i think you need to look at it uh, you're right larger the fund the the lower the irr right so you probably want to deploy you want to spread your money over there as well micro vc what's really important in vc and this is a mathematics because you know uh, we took a lot of time deciding ki micro vc karna hai ki vc karna hai but hamara thought kya tha ki in my history of investing every four years we found one investment to exit where we return all the capital So we try figuring out the math. If I have, let's say, two hundred twenty-five crore ka fund, let's say two hundred crore ka fund, what is the kind of exit value at which I can return all the capital? Right now, there are few ways to look at it. If I own at least ten percent in a company at the time of exit, a two thousand crore exit is equal to two hundred crore, which is equal to the size of the fund. Now that, or the other option is that I have, you know, two hundred companies in a two hundred crore fund. I own two two percent in each and every company. But what that means is that effectively return all the capital. I need to give you give. Almost a ten thousand crore exit, right? Up, uh, tell me which one is easier to get? Right? An exit of ten thousand crores or an exit of two thousand crores, right? And, and and this is mind you, just to return capital. This is not making money. Yet. Yeah, of course. So so that's that's why we chose the micro VC route, and we chose the amount of equity we'll own in a fund or in a company being in the higher double digits. So you have to look at it. What is the fund's actual strategy? Kya hai? Is it a spray and pray? Are they going to take? Let's say 100 million, and then deploy it into 150 companies, and then then yes, they'll make money. Uh, but remember, when you manage 150 companies, the cost is also going to be very very high, right? right? And 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 then you you literally are spraying and praying at that point. So you have to choose choose your devils correctly, right? And sometimes so so many of the larger funds, if you look at a you know again with a, if I name a few like a Sequoia or a yeah. or, or an Axel, they usually have very deep ownership in a company. Right, Oyo me. I think uh, Sequoia was as high as twenty twenty two percent. Right. So, क्या होता है कि when you when they get an exit of eight seven eight billion dollar valuation, right, and you own twenty percent of the company, that's a sizable chunk of money, you know. And I think those are the kind of things that you need to think through. कि कि when I'm investing in a fund, what is the strategy? Is it going to be seven hundred million and they're going to own five five percent across multiple companies? Then understand it's going to take them, you know, twenty times that average check. Or the size of the fund into the average ownership to be able to return capital. So seven hundred million to twenty is a fourteen billion dollar exit just to return capital. A fourteen billion dollar exit every day doesn't happen, right? So those are the kind of things that really, really need to be thought through because ownership really matters when you're when when you're investing in startups. Uh, so look at that before you uh, before you choose which strategy to back. So sometimes people say that private investments is a function of luck. Diversification, probability, and skills. What's your take? Like you said, pre model that is diversification. So now submit all of them. So what? What if you have to rank it? What is it? So I think luck. Uh, luck is when hard work, uh, planning, and perseverance meet with opportunity. Right. Yeah. So you you can swing your bat all you want, 
but if you don't swing it at the right time even even a half volley can get you out right yeah. so so i think yes luck is definitely definitely required but i think luck is required in everything in life right uh, however i i believe that uh, what's the most difficult part to do especially investing right is patience right aapke paas patience hona bahut zaruri hai because when you are uh, investing uh, you know in a, in a thesis in a very well thought out thesis results hamesha immediately nahi aate and especially i mean whether listed or unlisted i mean you know this better than i would that uh, it takes time it takes time for results to sh- to show and sometimes what happens is that you know when you're investing in startups or investing in even a in a listed portfolio it's like watching a plant grow if you watch it every single minute it's going to drive you crazy because <laughs> you're not going to watch it grow right but you you have to get your you have to give them enough space to grow uh if you're going to start scrutinizing them on a daily basis it you know you're, you're going to kill kill any kind of opportunity of them to grow uh and to be able to express themselves you have to give them enough you know enough uh, uh, space you know what and especially with a startup you know like get, ask them where do they need help right don't ask them for results until you given them enough enough you know enough help right if you start asking for results before that uh you're putting the cart before the horse right so one of the things we do with our startups is every week we we give them a call we we just go over the brief of what's happened over the last week right and we ask them to tell us what you need help with dump your problems on us and let me figure out how i can help you out right, right? and that gives them a lot of confidence ki i can have a very candid conversation about the business and about things that are ongoing with, uh, within the company and then there's somebody you know who can help me out sometimes just talking to them helps them out but sometimes i can actually open doors for them right ye bahut important aspect of of investing in vc so so i think that's where the luck come from because we talk to so many startups we get to know uh, the tremors before the earthquake because we talk to so many of yes. them and i think that's probably the luck that we created for ourselves yes 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 last one you know one fun fact about you what people don't know apart from oh. investing in money <laughs> I am an avid scuba diver. I uh, the only time I'm underwater, fun not intended, is when I'm when I'm scuba diving, right? <laughs> so uh, I uh, I've done 85 dives till date. I have uh, d- uh, dove uh, in Egypt. I've dove in uh, uh, in Indonesia. I've dove in Mexico. I've dove in uh, recently. I was in the Maldives for diving, and so that's 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 something that very few people know that I'm I'm into adventure sports, especially scuba diving. and i have to do with um, i mean in maldives i was like around i think must have must have been around 100 trucks at a time and it oh, was oh is it uh, okay oh yeah it was the most exhilarating experience in fact i had a massive nurse shark and i was on the seabed and it came and slept right next to me <laughs> it was it was quite exciting uh, so so yeah if if uh, if if you if you really want to have a chat uh, about yeah. scuba diving we can do a whole new podcast for that <laughs> it's, it's one of my it's one of my favorite things to do uh, and it really resets me uh, by the time i come back because it's only you this amazing world below 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 the water and your breath uh, for 45 minutes to an hour at a time so it, that that's some thing that most people probably don't know 